Professor Brad Wilcox. Thanks, Brother Joseph Anthony, and thanks also to my colleagues at the National Marriage Project. Uh, Hannah is coming in right now, Kyle's here in the audience already, and then Sam Richardson um, have also been really helpful in kind of getting <clears throat> both this presentation organized and then the book that's coming out soon as well, um, kind of written and done. So I'm grateful to them for helping with, with that. Um, so let me just kind of begin, though, by asking you to kind of give me a sense of here, who wants to be happy? So just kind of raise your hand if you'd like to be happy. Okay, so a pretty large share here, obviously. And, you know, you're not alone. <clears throat> Our civilization, I think as we all know here, is a nation that's dedicated, as Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, to the pursuit of happiness. This pursuit has been and remains fundamental to uh, the American experience. But lately, I think we can recognize, maybe in our own lives and also kind of in the polls like this one from Gallup, that happiness is kind of coming down in the U.S. We're kind of been losing out on that pursuit here in the U.S. Maybe kind of part of the problem that is afflicting our country when it comes to happiness, perhaps, is that we're pursuing the wrong things. We're kind of not adequately approaching or engaging, you know, the things that are most likely actually to engender a sense of happiness uh, in our lives. So I think part of the problem might be that our ruling class is kind of giving us some false signals that are sending us kind of down the wrong path, if you will, towards a path away from marriage and family, towards what could become of called man, towards work, towards money, and towards the unencumbered life, a life unencumbered by, again, things like a spouse and children. And this kind of idea came to me in part as I was thinking about uh, this headline that was sort of trending on Twitter one night as I, fin as I was finishing up <clears throat> my book that Father mentioned is coming out on Valentine's Day. And this title, though, that was trending on Twitter one night in the fall of last year, about a year ago, was from Bloomberg. And it said that, as you can see here on the screen, women who stay single and don't have kids are getting richer. Okay, so this Bloomberg article is kind of telling us that the path when it comes to prosperity for American women runs away from marriage and family, clearly. But it just to kind of give a kind of material message about marriage and family, it also kind of gave a message about happiness in this Bloomberg article written um, by Molly Wilson. And the message that kind of came through about the lives of women was also kind of anti-natal and, and anti-nuptial. And it profiled a number of women who were single and childless, kind of in, in midlife, who were just you know, killing it, basically. Women like Ashley Moreau is pictured up here on the screen. And she's a woman who splits her time between high-end properties in Manhattan and the Jersey Shore. She says that she takes, quote, frequent travel for pleasure as well as work. So the kind of the message that was coming through in this article from Bloomberg was that basically the recipe for a meaningful and happy life is leading away from marriage and family. And that from her perspective, kind of saying single and childless was kind of allowing her to live her best life. Or quote, she says here, I love my life and feel very fulfilled. Now this kind of message is not just coming through in one particular article from Bloomberg. It comes through on many different fronts, mainly kind of from more like the progressive mainstream cultural platforms, like for instance here in The Atlantic, an article called The Case Against Marriage, being pretty upfront with, you know, with the agenda here. Or in an article in The New York Times written by a law professor from San Francisco, talking about how, in her estimation, divorce can be an act of radical self-love, obviously to be celebrated as such. So I think probably everyone here in this room has a sense of the ways in which, really for decades in some ways, there's been a kind of message coming out from the mainstream media, from academe, and other kind of key cultural platforms, and oftentimes Hollywood as well, that is not very friendly to marriage and family, okay? But what's new about this kind of messaging is we're now beginning to see an anti-nuptial message emerging, not just from the left, if you will, but also from precincts in the right, okay? Precincts in the online right, what I call the red pill right, okay? And if, 
young folks who will know um, who I'm talking about uh, tonight, uh, people like Andrew Tate and people like Pearl Davis, right, who are kind of giving us a also a pretty negative take on marriage and family. And it's, you know, it's based upon a somewhat different perspective. They think that today marriage is a bad deal for guys, um, that the risk of divorce is so severe that men who kind of take the risk to get married and have kids are setting themselves up for a divorce and for some really you know, messy outcomes. Um, that's their concern. But the, sort of their bottom line here is that because of this risk, men should steer clear of marriage, should steer clear of family encumbrances, and should focus just on making lots of money, on killing it, and really kind of, frankly, and kind of using and abusing women that kind of come into their social uh, lives. It's kind of the takeaway from a lot of these um, red pill right influencers now on the internet. But again, from, from both in the sense now the left and the right in certain precincts, we're getting kind of this message that the path to prosperity and happiness runs away again from, from marriage and family. And as we kind of talk through this kind of issue to have the closing of the American heart, I think this is one reason um, that we're seeing, again, this closing of the American heart emerge. Um, I'm going to then respond to kind of, you know, what's happening with some more constructive points uh, about marriage that might be, uh, you know, a bit more encouraging. But first, let's talk about kind of the bad news uh, tonight. And again, the bad news is that the American heart is closing, I think, in part because of the kinds of messages we're getting today. Uh, from you know, many of our cultural elites. And so what's happening is that our civilization is in the midst of an epical shift, a shift away from marriage and all the fruits that follow from this most fundamental social institution, children, kin, financial stability, and even more importantly, so many opportunities both to be loved and to love someone else. And this is dark news, right, because we are, as Aristotle taught us, we are social animals. And we are most likely to flourish when we have so many opportunities to establish deep and abiding ties to other human beings, especially to family and to friends. And for most of us, you know, across human history, no ties have been as important as those found in hearth and home. But those ties are beginning to lose ground, obviously, in this country. In terms of the science that I'm thinking about tonight, I'm thinking about, for instance, the fact that the marriage rate has come down 65% since 1970, the year that I was born. Okay. Now, if you've been in my big family class, um, you've had an experience with this kind of exercise I'm going to do right now. So I'll just ask the UVA students here just to kind of quickly come up to the front of the room for a second. And we're going to just do two quick exercises. So if you guys students here could just, or recent graduates from Virginia Tech, for instance, <laughs> could just come up here for a second. I'm going to do just two things with you. Nothing embarrassing, but just kind of two things. Just come on up if you're a, either a UVA undergraduate or a recent graduate of another college. Okay, so you can see again that we've lost about 65% in the marriage rate since 1970. But what does that mean practically, okay? What does that mean practically for young adults today is, is the question that I'm thinking about right now, okay? And so if I look at this group here right before me, yeah, this is actually perfect, okay? So what I'm suggesting tonight is that basically for young adults your age, okay, about this portion, of the group right here on my left um, will never get married, okay, for people, um, you know, in this demographic, for 20-somethings in America. So one in three young adults today, people who are this age, are um, never going to get married, okay, based upon current projections, okay. And we've never been in kind of a pattern that's this extreme when it comes to marriage, okay. So let me just take um, I'll just take maybe you two, I actually know Anna, but I'll start with you. Um, how would you feel like if you couldn't get married? Like, what would that make you feel? I mean, I wouldn't be really happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good response. Okay. Anna, how about you? Yeah, I would like to get married, so I'd probably be pretty sad. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you for those quick responses around the money here for tonight's uh, conversation. Okay, so one more exercise in the same story. You guys can stay where you are. Um, and that is that we've been seeing, because in part, right, marriage is down, 
What also is down, obviously, is also fertility. Okay, so we're at about 1.64 TFR right now. It means that the average woman on average have about 1.64 kids over the course of her life. And again, we're kind of in record territory on the lower end of the, you know, the demographic trends here. And my colleagues who are demographers are projecting we're going to go even lower in the coming years, um, you know, in terms of where we're going to be in terms of fertility. But again, that seems like an abstract number, 1.6 kids, you know, what does that really mean for ordinary people, okay? And so I'm going to have just you know, the three of you just go over here, please, okay? And we're going to keep this group right here, okay? It's a little bit smaller, you can tell here, right? So what this means really practically is that one in four young adults today um, will never have kids, will never become a mother or a father. And again, we're, this is like record demographic territory. We've never had kind of a generation of younger Americans kind of heading off into obviously then middle age and, and late age who won't have kids, um, you know, based upon what we're seeing in the demographic trends more generally. I'll just move down to the two other ladies here. With, how would this, if you wouldn't mind me just asking this question, how would you feel about not having children in, in your future? Actually, I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, great. That's, a, that's, a, that's an honest perspective. Um, I, yeah, I think I would be very upset. Yeah. Okay, and actually these two different responses are actually, I think, really you know, on the money in terms of I think we're gonna have kind of different perspectives on kind of a, a future that may or may not involve having kids. But again, the point I'm making in part tonight is that we haven't really seen things like this before in our country, where so many people for a range of different reasons are not gonna get married and not gonna have children. So we're gonna be thinking about that in part tonight. So you all can sit back down. Thank you for your, your comments too. So what I'm suggesting then tonight is that when it comes to kind of the closing of the American heart, again, a large minority of men and women uh, will not marry or have kids. And that means that as they kind of head into midlife and later life, they're not gonna have immediate kin. So in China, there's a term for this. And the term is called, you know, a, a bare branch, or bare branch is kind of as the more common pattern. It's kind of signaling that there are millions of people in China who are living without immediate kin, okay? And my point is that this pattern is just crossing the Pacific and coming to the US. We're gonna see millions of women and men, you know, in, in America without kin as they kind of push past 50 and beyond. And the problem with this kind of trend, kind of viewed from a sociological lens, is one that we can kind of see already playing out in countries like Japan, where fertility hit our current rate in 1987 before falling much lower in the land of what I would call the setting sun, okay? And what this means in Japan is they have lots of older people and comparatively fewer younger people now in Japan. What they're also seeing in Japan is a population loss, about 500,000 people every year right now in Japan, pretty, pretty catastrophic. They're seeing economic stagnation because they don't have enough younger adults becoming um, both workers and consumers in the Japanese economy. They're experiencing fiscal problems as well um, for the government. But beyond all of this, there is a way in which there's a kind of rising tide of loneliness that's unfolding in Japan. This was articulated in a harrowing story in the New York Times, for instance, that told the tale of a generation of elderly Japanese who were living in extreme isolation in their final years. And in this context of where so many older Japanese are living without kin, they had also kind of this point made about sort of the last chapter for older Japanese men and women. It's this, it's a quote, the extreme isolation of elderly Japanese is so common that an entire industry has emerged around it, specializing in cleaning out apartments where decomposing remains are found. Because people don't have kin visiting them, you know, they're often not discovered until, you know, weeks, maybe even a month or two after their death. Okay, so this is just kind of one, I think, sobering example of the way in which kind of the decline of kinship and the rise of their branches in Japan has had, um, you know, a pretty dramatic effect 
um, and this is the future that's going to be facing, unfortunately, many Americans in, uh, in the years to come. Now, of course, when you make this kind of point, in the current culture, there are many talking heads, there are many journalists, and there are many even academics who kind of discount, you know, the, the reality I'm talking about. We kind of say it's really not that big a deal, it's not that important, it's not something really to be worried about. I'm thinking here of, for instance, Eric Klinenberg, a sociologist at NYU, the author of Going Solo, a book about the rise of, of single adults in America. And, for, you know, in the main, he thinks we've got really nothing to worry about with this new development that I'm describing tonight. So in an interview with the New York Times, for instance, he couldn't muster a negative word about the falling fortunes of marriage and family in this New York Times interview. Talking about kind of all these singles, he, he said that for young professionals, it's a sign of success and a mark of distinction. A way to gain freedom and experience the anonymity that can make city life so exhilarating. For someone who's recently divorced, it's a way to reassert control over your life and maybe become less lonely. So words like success and control and freedom are being obviously associated here with the single life, with kind of flying solo in American life from his perspective. So again, kind of like this, this isn't really a big deal that we're seeing here in the United States, the rise of so many people who don't have a spouse or who don't have children in a sense. All these focus more on, on the lack of a spouse in this book. But from my perspective, in a world that's increasingly marked by a rising economic inequality, where millions of Americans don't have $1,000 in savings to cover, for instance, an emergency expense, in a society where too many of us are glued to what I call our electronic opiates, that often leave us anxious and depressed, in a country where community is often crumbling and loneliness is rising, here you know, in America, and in a cultural context where fewer and fewer common norms ground and guide our lives kind of day in and day out, in this context, in this economic, in this technological, in this social, and this normative context, I think actually that marriage and family matter more than ever for the welfare of our kids and our adults here in the U.S. That's my hypothesis tonight, right? So what's the evidence, you know, in support of this hypothesis? Well, when it comes to the welfare of kids, for instance, what we're seeing is that even though we are more tolerant and accepting of family diversity in this country, and I've got colleagues who think that would mean that, like, the effect of divorce, for instance, or family disability would be lower for kids today, actually seeing the opposite story play out for our kids. I'm just going to give you one sense of how that plays out in, in, the, in the recent literature. So my colleagues and I, Mr. Family Studies, did an analysis of the relationship between family structure and college graduation for baby boomers here on the bottom and for millennials there on the top. And what this analysis basically shows, pretty much we control for a range of different background characteristics, is that the relationship between family structure and the odds of graduating from college, a college like UVA, for instance, that that relationship has almost doubled from the baby boomer generation to the millennial generation. So what I'm suggesting tonight then is that it, what we're seeing is, is the case that when it comes to college graduation, when it comes to school suspensions, when it comes to family economic well-being for kids, it's not just that marriage matters for them, it's that it matters more than ever for them. That's kind of the point I'm making um, on, this, on this slide. Because that's kids. What about adults? So when we look at adults, we can think about this issue of prosperity. Because recall that Bloomberg wants to tell us that for today's women, kind of marriage and other things is a bad deal. Okay? Well, Bloomberg is completely wrong. And actually, the, the way they used their data in that story was, you know, uh, was deeply flawed. What we're actually seeing in the, in the work that I've done with colleagues is that the premium here in green for married folks um, compared to unmarried folks when it comes to their household income um, has grown about fourfold since 1970, the year that I was born. You look at assets 
for instance, to look at just another outcome, um, for married Americans versus unmarried Americans who are in their 50s heading close to retirement, you see a story that's sort of much like this, and that is that married folks are just in much better position financially in terms of their assets compared to their unmarried peers, even controlling for things like you know, education and race um, and ethnicity that might otherwise you know, confound that relationship um, with family status and assets. So again, when it comes to prosperity, the truth actually is, is that marriage seems to matter more than ever for uh, American adults. And then let's think too about happiness, because that was kind of the point that began with in terms of Jefferson and the Declaration. What's sort of the point about happiness? And as we think about this particular topic, I want to also just sort of mention that as I talk to UVA students and kind of get you know, a sense of what's happening on grounds here at the University of Virginia, I often am left with the impression that they're focusing a lot more on you know, their education, and their immediate professional future than they are kind of their family future. So for instance, one UVA professor told me that he was talking to a promising young student here, a UVA guy, he kind of had like a five point plan for his graduate training, his first job, you know, his next job. He kind of had a very clear sense of where he was headed in terms of his work and his professional location. And then this guy asked him some questions about kind of what's your plan about marriage and family? And the guy here at UVA was completely tongue-tied. He had kind of no way of kind of really answering that question. It's like emblematic, I think, of how a lot of young adults are kind of thinking about what's sort of important uh, for them. So I'm gonna just invite um, Kyle to come up here. Kyle McLeod is one of my RAs um, for the National Marriage Project. And he's been looking at what's called the general social survey to kind of look at the relationship between um, different factors in the social world and happiness. Um, but Kyle, in terms of the, the story I just told about a colleague here at UVA and his sort of interaction with a UVA student, how does it strike you? Is that kind of on the money from your experience or not? Um, yes, I would say no. Thank you. I would say that's correct. I think most UVA students can talk at length about their professional and academic achievements, but when it comes to thinking about the future of their relationships, it's a little bit more of a difficult question. It's important to kind of note this is not just a UVA experience. We're seeing in data from both Pew and from the Wall Street Journal that there is kind of like a rising tide of sort of young adult opinion that tells us that people are under the impression that when it comes to happiness or your fulfillment, that education, work, and money are often more likely, particularly work, are kind of more likely, they think, to kind of engender a sense of happiness or fulfillment for them. So this is kind of like a very common view among not just UVA students, but among young adults more generally across the US. So how is we kind of looking at the empirics here? And how does education, how does money, how does work compare with marriage in predicting happiness in the GSS? This sort of big, you know, gold standard social barometer that's, that's uh, funded by the feds and conducted by the University of Chicago every two years. So what's the story there in terms of the data here? So Kyle, let's just kind of look at the GSS. Um, when it comes to education, work, and money, what do you see about their association with happiness in, the, in this data? Um, they are uh, significantly correlated with happiness, especially job satisfaction. So people's kind of intuition that work could be an important source of satisfaction for them is correct. You can see here in this next slide, what's sort of the story here, Kyle? So in this slide, we find a standard bar graph showing the um, increase in the odds of answering is very happy in the global happiness survey for the general uh, social survey. And you see that if you uh, achieved a college education, you are 64% more likely to um, answer is very happy, 88% for higher income, and 145% if you are very satisfied with the work that you are doing. Okay, but what do we see though about marriage here in the data time? It crushes everything else. Uh, a happy marriage is by far the best predictor for um, being very happy. 
And I, I should add that as crazy as that number looks, I ran the numbers for the 2022 data yesterday, and it's now even higher. It's less. And our culture obviously tends to kind of put a premium on sex, for instance. How would sort of sexual frequency here compare to the bar on the right? Significantly less. So as we kind of, both Kyle and I have looked at the GSS, and we've kind of thrown a lot of different variables into the model statistically. And again, what we're seeing here in this particular um, research is that when it comes to global happiness, there's a very powerful association between having a good marriage and being happy with your life more generally. And of course, this is not the only outcome to be concerned about. This is, I think, worth noting, kind of given sort of the popular assumption that things like education and work are the things, just to understand that empirically, they're not the thing. And the thing here is, you know, basically a good marriage. Thanks, Kyle. And we can think about this too, kind of from the kind of the more critical perspective. I mentioned before that when it comes to kids' outcomes on a number of uh, fronts, and financially, that there's evidence that marriage matters more than ever for American kids and adults. When it comes to kind of reports about happiness too in the GSS, we're seeing um, not just that there's a gap between those who are unmarried. That's the top line here. Um, and those who are married, that's the bottom line here, but that, that gap is more than doubling from 2000 to 2021. So again, what I'm seeing here in the data is that not being married is linked to a greater risk um, of being unhappy, and again, that this sort of gap is, is growing here in the U.S. today in this newer social, economic, technological, and normative context. Okay, we've been kind of a bit abstract here, and I want to just kind of tell you a, a quick story to kind of give you a sense of how this kind of trend can play out in the life of an ordinary 30-something woman, um, who I, call, <clears throat> I will call Taylor, and she lives in the, in the Rocky Mountain West. Now, Taylor prioritized mammon over marriage uh, in her 20s, and now at the age of 33, she's having second thoughts about kind of her approach to life. And she recalls that as a young woman, she was told, you know, don't get married too young. Go out and see the world and do all these other things. And don't get too attached to anyone too quickly, was the message she got kind of from her peers and from her parents. She took this advice seriously and focused on a career in digital marketing in her 20s, rather than on dating with an eye towards getting married. Now she's wondering about that strategy. In her words, I look back on that advice. And I'm like, you know, if I could do it again, I would actually focus on finding a husband a little bit earlier, she said. Her single state is especially hard for her because she feels like she doesn't have a ton of, this is her words, quote, doesn't have a ton of meaning, unquote, in her life right now. And by contrast, the time she spends babysitting for her nieces and nephews, whom she loves, has left her thinking that she would be more fulfilled if she were married with children. Quote, the older I get, I'm like, you know, is there a chance that I could have a family of my own right now? You know, do fun things with them, finger paint, whatever. I, I don't know what kids do, was what she said to me, okay? Now, I want to be honest here, obviously. There are plenty of single folks who are flourishing in one way or another. Not every single person is like Taylor. I obviously heard the Bloomberg um, person who seemed to be flourishing. So I'm not suggesting that, you know, this is sort of the story for everyone, but kind of gives you, I mean, her story kind of gives you a sense of the, uh, gives you kind of a, a face, if you will, behind the, the numbers that I just discussed in, in the previous slide. And then more constructively, too, um, we can think about a different story. Uh, a woman named Catherine who lives here in Virginia. She's a married mother of two. And it kind of conveys kind of the, the flip side um, to what we've been talking about tonight. She's, um, well, she says that, you know, when she was a single, childless person, yeah, she had more free time and more opportunities to do fun things, from window shopping to eating out to following her favorite female bloggers um, when she was single and childless. She says that today her life, quote, is harder now that I have kids, end quote, a crying baby 
a dirty kitchen or a toddler tantrum disrupt her day on a regular basis. Family life has forced her to, quote, really die to myself and become selfless. But, she insists, this death to self has given way to a newer and fuller life. Quote, I do find a lot of purpose and meaning in the mundane day-to-day -day activities of family life, as well as the more exciting times when you have a really great moment with one of them referring to her two young children. And compared to her single self, she is less lonely now and has, quote, fewer moments of sadness now. Her happiness with life is, quote, fuller because it's shared with my husband and kids. So for Catherine, it's true that the kind of move to motherhood has required sacrifice and is often stressful. But motherhood has also left her feeling more compassionate, more charitable, and connected. Quote, I think there's a deeper fulfillment there, she said, talking about her life. And it's important to note here that as I've looked at um, this data with Kyle and with Grant and with um, Tommy Murray as well, a bunch of other folks who many people here know, um, in the GSS we are seeing that today that there is no group of both women and men um, who are more happy than those who are you know, married moms and married fathers in that 18 to 55 demographic. It's important here to note too, just for I think for kind of the women and the moms here in you know in the audience tonight, that the story is a little bit different for women who are 18 to 34 versus 35 to 55. So for women who are 18 to 34, being married and childless, they're a little bit happier than the married moms are at that stage. But in the 35 to 55 bracket, married moms clearly are doing better on average when it comes to happiness than women who are you know married and childless and the women who are single. Um, mothers and women who are, who are single and childless. So again, kind of in that prime space from 35 to 55 for both women and men, there's just no question that married moms and married dads are on average doing better than <clears throat> their fellow Americans in the happiness department. So this is all to say kind of that I think it's the case that the path to prosperity and happiness for most Americans, and of course we all know that there are exceptions here, um, for most Americans tends to run through a marriage and family um, rather than away from it is, is the, you know, is the empirical story that my own work is, is kind of um, suggesting. Okay, so we're kind of heading towards conclusion here tonight. And kind of given what I've said in terms of what's happening in terms of the closing of the American heart on the one hand, but also in the sense of the paradox that in the midst of losing ground kind of demographically, it seems to be the case that folks who are married with kids are doing, you know, relatively better than their fellow Americans who are not on a number of fronts. And, you know, that leads to this question. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this tonight um, because it is uh, 8 o'clock. But if marriage is so valuable, why is it in retreat? And there's obviously a lot that could be said. I say a lot about this in my book for HarperCollins. But I think four things just to hit quickly are that we're seeing more and more men kind of failing to launch successfully and failing to engage the workplace um, by embracing kind of full-time work. So I think part of this is kind of a, a male malaise that's part of what's happening here and that makes them obviously less attractive as potential husbands. Um, we're also seeing what I've described as kind of the rise of electronic opiates, you know, the smartphone being the obvious example here, and that tends to reduce, you know, people's capacity to really kind of socialize and date with clear implications for marriage. Um, we're seeing also increased social atomization where fewer people are involved in churches, for instance, and in other forms of secular civic engagement. So there are fewer opportunities to kind of meet people in real world contexts in ways that would kind of facilitate or foster marriage. And then we're of course seeing too, and this has been going on for many, many years now, just kind of the erosion of kind of clear norms sort of governing things like dating and, and marriage and family life. So this is also one other reason why I think we're seeing a retreat from marriage in our common life uh, today. So in light of all this, so what is to be done practically? And I could give you a bunch of public policies. I'm not gonna do that tonight, kind of given this audience. I'm just gonna give you some advice about kind of how young adults could kind of concretely and practically, I think, um, sort of maximize their chances of getting married successfully. So the first thing I wanna say is kind of towards the young men in the audience. That's just to kind of be more basically, you know, intentional 
about living a life that sort of maximizes the gifts that you've been given. So that requires obviously discerning what kind of gifts you have, um, both in general, but also gifts that might be kind of relevant for your future profession if you're a college student, for instance. I think it also means kind of taking college more seriously. Um, obviously, there, there's a lot of different patterns here at UVA, but I would say that on average, women tend to be more engaged in classes than men. Um, and we also know, of course, that there are more women now at UVA than there are men. So in general, I think you know, our younger men need to be more um, kind of uh, intentional about taking the best opportunities, or taking their opportunities in terms of college and education more generally, and generally kind of using them to their fullest. Um, and the third point would be kind of just sort of begin to appreciate you have a vocation professionally of some sort. You need to be kind of taking very concrete steps to, you know, make a path forward in that, in that profession so that you will become the kind of man that you should be. And then also, of course, you'll be more attractive as, um, you know, as a spouse um, in, in this kind of context because even in 2023, we still see that uh, women are looking for guys who are doing reasonably well when it comes to the workplace. So that's sort of one of four pieces of concrete advice. The second piece of advice is about kind of being intentional, both in college and kind of in the next decade, about recognizing and realizing that we tend to learn more about people um, in person. And so that if you have the opportunity to kind of meet someone you know, in person, what we're seeing in the research is you're more likely to be flourishing longer term, you know, in your marriage. So obviously, um, the number one thing here is people who are meeting in some kind of church or religious context are the most likely to be doing well in their marriages, as this um, research from my colleague, Dr. Wendy Wang, tells us, okay? Uh, but also maybe even like a wedding party would be a good place to meet someone, you know, judging by the second bar here. Um, or, you know, maybe in a college class. I first spied my wife, Danielle, um, in a Frederick Nietzsche class here at UVA, of all things, that's kind of a weird, you know, <laughs> reality. Um, but I saw her in this Nietzsche class, and then I saw her on grounds walking around the lawn, and, you know, I wanted to get to know her, and, you know, had a friend who kind of put us together on a blind date on April Fool's Day, back in 1992, our fourth year at UVA. I think she was kind of thinks the April Fool's piece is appropriate given all that's happened since then. Um, but again, the point I'm making more seriously is simply to recognize and appreciate that for most of us, I think having the opportunity to meet in person can be helpful. And you know, obviously that Tinder is not as good a way to, to meet folks as kind of having lots of experiences in person with people and getting to know them beyond just sort of the, the profile of mine. Okay. Um, so that's sort of the point here in this slide. The third um, advice, piece of advice that I would give out here um, goes back to the man in the room. And it's kind of about the importance of asking someone out on a date. Um, you know, being brave, um, being concrete, using the D word. Um, recognizing, of course, that you might fail, but you might not, right? And that's, that's, that's the rub, okay? And so I'm thinking here of the kind of the life experience of of Arthur Brooks, the former president of the American Enterprise Institute, who's now a Harvard Business School professor. He kind of asked uh, a woman out um, when he was in his 20s. Um, and he kind of had just met her in Spain when he was uh, playing in a band there. This is kind of his story. So she was 25, I was 24. We spent only a couple of days together and shared no language in common. When I returned to the United States from that European music festival, I announced to my parents that I'd met my future wife. Of course, I had to convince Esther first, so I tackled the project as if it were a startup. I began by studying Spanish. Before long, I quit my job and moved to her native Barcelona. It's a pretty intense guy. Um, <laughs> where I knew no one except her in hot pursuit. The market pressure was intense. Men would shout wedding proposals to her from moving cars. But I pressed on, undeterred. It took two years to close the deal, but she finally said yes 